Hare Krishna everyone, welcome back to the daily readings of Srila Prabhupada's books. Today we're at the live studios here at Hode Farm in the Olive Tree Cottage, which we renamed College because there's so much high level learning going on around here. Halfway between Folkestone and Canterbury, here in Kent, southeast. England and I'm sitting here with a room full of glowing vibrant affectionate loving Vaishnavas and I'm overwhelmed but I'll try to get it together by the mercy of all of you and by the mercy of all of you out there in cyberspace and we were listening today about to Austin who's traveling with me <clears throat> we were listening to Gopi Paranadana Prabhu's lecture and he was explaining <clears throat> very nicely how it is that this Srimad Bhagavatam is so special you know all the Vedas and the Puranas and the Itihasas and there's hundreds and thousands of verses which describe spiritual life and describe so many things, the philosophy of uh, spiritual life. But the Bhagavatam is special. We take the Bhagavatam as our first line of authority. And if we find something that appears to be contradicted in uh, the Mahabharata, for, for instance, or you know the Puranas or the whatever, whatever scripture, if there seems to be something that's uh, contradictory, rather than trying to figure it out, because some, sometimes you can reconcile by going through the Puranas and finding out that this happened to be in another millennium or another creation or another person that's not the same person. Or, there's ways of figuring this out. And Gopi Puranana, who is the only person, to my knowledge, in our movement, at least at the time I knew him, who had the capacity to do that, because he read all the scriptures uh, on, on the original, by the original. And he gave this one idea that actually really lit up both, both of us up. And that is that if you find any contradiction, take the Bhagavatam as your first line of authority, and don't worry about the other one. Uh, another point he made, <clears throat> you know, in the 80s, there were translations of literatures that are mentioned in Srila Prabhupada's books uh, that began to be translated by devotees, by Yaskan devotees, uh, Kushakrata uh, and others. And <clears throat> generally there were no commentaries. So, you know, one thing led to the other and devotees began to go to authorities they trusted and there were devotees you could trust, authorities you could trust to find out what these things were and what they meant. But over time, we found that the, the translations weren't always as accurate as, as they could be or maybe they just, they weren't off but they weren't, they weren't taking enough out of the Sanskrit into the English to make it clear or to make it accessible to us. I remember when I first read the Chaitanya Charitamrita in, back in the 70s, uh, there's a purport in the Adi Lila, chapter 5, verse 203, in which Prabhupada makes this very strong statement, which we, by the way, put on the cover of the Riya Bhagavatamrita, that uh, anyone who wants to understand Krishna, Krishna consciousness, devotees, devotional service, must read this book, Riya Bhagavatamrita. So I immediately tried to find the book. <clears throat> I found the Gaudiya Math version. There was no purport. Gopi Puranadana Prabhu is the first person on the earth that was able to translate cogently and wonderfully into English, the Dig Darshani, Darshani commentary 
of the Brihad Bhagavatam. It is the only auto commentary of these major uh, uh, Sanyaka uh, Goswamis of Vrindavan's books. But no one could translate it. In the foreword, um, uh, Dr. Joseph T. O'Connell, who was at the time uh, the top authority when this book came out, uh, in the academic world for top authority, and he gave very high praise to the G for the BBT trustees for publishing it without, in full, without cutting, making shortcuts to make it shorter and make it cheaper or whatever, less time. And Gopi Pranadana Prabhu, he just praised him for his ability to translate the commentary for the first time. Uh, and also the editor, the, the, who I take as Jadweta Swami. I was in training at that time. I was just a has been, was been, wannabe editor. And uh, he said that the text flowed so smoothly from one topic to another. This is Dr. O'Connell. He said he tended to forget that he was even reading a translation. This is such high praise. So, um, so when I went to look for the Brihad Bhagavatamrita in India, while I was in India visiting the Holy Dhams, and I found one from the Gaudiya Mat, I could part. I couldn't understand it. Even the verses, I couldn't. The English was very jerky, and it wasn't clear. And so now we have the Bhagavatam translated by Prabhupada. We've got this prayer that I'm about to read from Gopi Pranadana Prabhu. And the BBT, if you stick to the Bhagavatam and the literatures that were published by the Bhagavatam, you're going to get the closest thing to correct as you can get. And... Uh, So then Gopi said, just imagine if no one had <coughs> opened Pandora's box and none of these literatures were translated by persons who maybe didn't have perfect understanding or perfect skills in Sanskrit or English or both, because you need both. And uh, he was talking to his Sanskrit students and he said, so what would happen if that hadn't happened? And we only had Prabhupada's books. He said most of the kind of controversies that come around about certain subject matters, they wouldn't even exist, first of all. They wouldn't exist. And second of all, we'd have enough to go back to Godhead. So we can assimilate the Srimad Bhagavatam, Chaitanya Charitamrita, the Gita, Brihad Bhagavatam, we now we have properly done. Uh, who can assimilate those books in a lifetime all those books so we're just really lucky so we should count our blessings and move on to hear the Srimad Bhagavatam together <clears throat> the prime authority for spiritual life oh thanks I hope we didn't break anything did we? are you getting sound? are you getting sound? Can you tell? So far we have no complaints from the... Okay, very good. Sanatana Goswami heard more, uh, was taught for a longer period of time than any other person on the earth. And it was Sanatana Goswami that wrote the Briya Bhagavatamrita. And just after that he wrote the Sri Krishna Lila Stava, which is a very succinct, uh, simple Sanskrit, short, only like 450 verses. Glorification of the Vrindavan Leela pastimes of Krishna, written in vocative Sanskrit, which is very simple. And <clears throat> his idea was to uh, his idea was to offer 108 obeisances to those pastimes. And you know, there's a few verses, and then that's 
a base into one, then a few verses and the base is two, like that, all the way. And, and this is the 107th obeisance. He kept it to the last because he's glorifying the literature that gave us the Le Rindav and Leela pastimes of Sri Krishna and his associates. Srimad Bhagavata Mahima Stotram appears in Sri Krishna Leela Stava, texts 412 through 416. The book is available, you want to get it. Um, and it goes like this Sarva Shastabdi Piyusha, Sarva Vedaika Satpala, Sarva Vedaika Satpala, Sarva Lokaika Drik Prada, O nectar from the ocean of all scriptures, singular fruit of all the Vedas, rich mine of the precious gems of all conclusive truths, you are the only giver of sight to all the worlds. Sarva Bhagavata Prana, Srimad Bhagavata Prabho, Kalidwandodita Ditya, Sri Krishna Parivartita. O life heir of all the Supreme Lord's devotees, O Master, Srimad Bhagavatam, you are the sun risen in the darkness of Kali. You are the exact image of Sri Krishna. Paramananda Pataya, Prema Varshak Shadayate, Sarvada Sarvasevyaya, Sri Krishnaya Namostume. I bow down to you, who are supremely blissful to read. Your every syllable pours down a flood of prema. You can always be served by everyone. You are, you are Sri Krishna Himself. You are Sri Krishna Himself. You are Sri Krishna Himself. Marika Bando Mat Sangin Mat Man Mahadana Man Nishtadaga Mat Bhagya Madananda Namostute my only friend, my constant companion, my spiritual master, my great wealth, my savior, my good fortune, my source of ecstasy, I bow down to you. Asadu, sadu tadayin, atini chochatakara, anamunchagadachin mam, prem narit kantayospura. O bestower of saintliness to the unsaintly, O exalter of the most fallen, please never leave me. Always appear in my heart and my voice with pure love, which is my evidence that we should all hear the Bhagavatam out loud. And my voice with pure love. If you have troubles reading, and many people do now in this age, if you read out loud yourself to yourself or to others, you will find it's magic. Full stop, no exceptions. Okay. <clears throat> Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. So Krishna is continuing his pastimes. We've reached the 10th canto, 18th chapter. He's about six years old now. Or at least he looks like he's six years old. <clears throat> Chapter 18, Lord Balaram slays the demon Perlamba. Mm. The killing of Perlamba Sura, as described in this chapter, is described in this chapter. While playing happily in Vrindavan, Lord Baladev climbed up on the shoulders of the demon Perlamba and struck his head with his fist destroying him. Sri Vrindavan, where Krishna and Balaram enacted their pastimes, was even during the summer decorated with all the qualities of spring. 
At that time, Lord Sri Krishna would become absorbed in various sports, surrounded by Balarama and all the cowherd boys. One day, they were intently dancing, singing, and playing when a demon named Pralamba entered their midst disguised as a cowherd boy. The omniscient Lord Krishna saw through the disguise, but even as he thought of how to kill the demon, he treated him as a friend. Krishna then suggested to his young friends and Baladev that they play a game involving contending parties. Taking the role of leaders, Krishna and Balaram divided the boys into two groups and determined that the losers would have to carry the winners on their shoulders. Thus, when Sri Dhamma and Vrishabha, members of Balaram's party, were victorious, Krishna and another boy in his party carried them on their shoulders. Pralambasura thought that the unconquerable Lord Sri Krishna would be too great an opponent to contend with. So the demon fought with Balaram instead and was defeated. Taking Lord Balaram on his back, Pralambasura began to walk away very swiftly. But Balaram became as heavy as Mount Sumeru and the demon, unable to carry him, had to reveal his true demoniac form. See, these are not ordinary people that are being sent by Kangsa to kill Krishna. They're all huge yogis with mystic powers that you can't imagine. Some of them are even terrorizing at the same time the heavenly planets. When Balaram saw this terrible form, he struck the demon a ferocious blow on the head with his fist. This blow shattered Pralambasura's head just as a lightning bolt, like lightning bolts hur hurled by the king of the demigods, shatter mountains. The demon repeatedly vomited blood and then fell upon the ground. When the cowherd boys saw Lord Balaram returned, they joyfully embraced and congratulated him as the demigod showered garlands of flowers from the heavens and glorified him. Imagine he's doing this every day. You know, it comes time for lunch and they need to stop their play. They forget, you know, how kids are. They play and they forget. The demons come just timely so they can stop their play and have lunch. Then before they go home, another demon comes so they can stop their play and then get ready to go home. Text 1. <clears throat> Shukadev Goswami said, Surrounded by his blissful companions, who constantly chanted his glories, Sri Krishna then entered the village of Braja, which was decorated with herds of cows. Text 2. While Krishna and Balarama were thus enjoying life in Vrindavan, in the guise of ordinary cowherd boys, the summer season gradually appeared. This season is not very pleasing to the embodied souls. Purport. Sorry, it's Radha Raman. Purport. In chapter 18 of Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Srila Prabhupada comments as follows. The summer season in India is not very much welcomed because of the excessive heat, but in Vrindavan everyone was pleased because summer there appeared just like spring. Text 3 Nevertheless, because the Supreme Personality of Godhead was personally staying in Vrindavan along with Balaram, summer manifested the qualities of spring. Such are the features of the land of Vrindavan. Text 4. <clears throat> in Vrindavan, the, the loud sound of waterfalls covered the cricket's noise, and clusters of trees 
constantly moistened by spray from those waterfalls, beautified the entire area. Purport. This and the following three verses describe how Vrindavan manifested the features of spring, even during the summer season. Text 5. <clears throat> the wind wafting over the waves of the lakes and flowing rivers carried away the pollen of many varieties of lotuses and water lilies and then cooled the entire Vrindavan area. Thus the residents there did not suffer from the heat generated by the blazing summer sun and seasonal forest fires. Indeed, Vrindavan was abundant with fresh green grass. Text 6 <clears throat> With their flowing waves, the deep rivers drenched their banks, making them damp and muddy. Thus the rays of the sun, which were as fierce as poison, could not evaporate the earth's sap or parch its green grass. Flowers beautifully decorated the forest of Vrindavan, and many varieties of animals and birds filled it with sound. The peacocks and bees sang, and the cuckoos and cranes cooed. Intending to engage in pastimes, Lord Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, accompanied by Lord Balaram and surrounded by the cowherd boys and the cows, entered the forest of Vrindavan as he played his flute. Text 9 decorating themselves with newly grown leaves, along with peacock feathers, garlands, clusters of flower buds, and colored minerals. Balaram, Krishna, and their cowherd friends danced, wrestled, and sang. As Krishna danced, some of the boys accompanied him by singing, and others by playing flutes, hand cymbals, and buffalo horns, while still others praised his dancing. Purport. Wanting to encourage Sri Krishna, some of the cowherd boys openly praised his dancing. O king, demigods disguised themselves as members of the cowherd community, and just as dramatic actors <clears throat> and just as dramatic dancers praise another dancer, worshipped Krishna and Balaram, who were also appearing as cowherd boys. <clears throat> Krishna and Balaram played with their cowherd boyfriends by whirling about, leaping, hurling, slapping, and fighting. Sometimes Krishna and Balaram would pull the hair on the boys' heads. Purport. <clears throat> the Acharyas have explained this verse as follows. The word Brahmanai indicates that the boys, pretending they were machines, would sometimes whirl around and they, until they became dizzy. Sound familiar? We, we did that when we were kids, right? You whirl around until you became dizzy. They would also sometimes jump about, langanai. The word chepai indicates that sometimes they would hurl objects like balls or stones, and that sometimes they would grab each other by the arms and throw one, throw one another around. Aspotana means that sometimes they would slap one another's shoulders or backs, and vikarshanai indicates they would indicates they would drag one another about in the midst of their play. By the word by the word niyudina, arm wrestling, and other types of friendly fighting are indicated, and the word kakapakshadaro means that Krishna and Balaram would sometimes grab the hair on the other boys' heads in a playful manner. Text thirteen. While the boys were dancing, while the other boys were dancing, O king, Krishna and Balaram would sometimes accompany them with song 
in instrumental music. And sometimes the two lords would praise the boys, saying, very good, very good. Text, text 14. <clears throat> sometimes the cowherd boys would play the bilba or kumba fruits, and sometimes with handfuls of amalaka fruits. At other times, they would play the games of trying to touch one another or of trying to identify someone while one is blindfolded. And sometimes they would imitate animals and birds. Purport. Srila Sanatan Goswami explains that the word adyai by other sp such sports indicates such games as chasing one another and building bridges. Another pastime would occur at noon while Lord Krishna was taking rest. Nearby, the young cowherd girls would be passing by, singing, and, the Christ and Krishna's boyfriends would pretend to inquire from them about the price of milk. When the boys would steal, then the boys would steal yogurt and other items from them and run away. Krishna, Balaram, and their friends would also play games in which they would cross the river in boats. Srila Vishwanath Chagavati Thakur further explains that the boys would play with fruits by throwing a few in the air and then throwing others to try to hit them. The word netrabanda indicates a game in which one boy would approach a blindfolded boy from behind and place his palms over the blindfolded boy's eyes. Then simply by the feel of his palms, the blindfolded boy would have to guess who the other boy was. In all such games, the boys put up stakes for the winner, such as flutes or walking sticks. Sometimes the boys would imitate the various fighting methods of the forest animals, and at other times they would chirp like birds. Text 15. They would sometimes jump like frogs, sometimes play various jokes, sometimes ride in swings, and sometimes imitate, imitate monarchs. We have a few prime ministers around here, presidents that are imitating monarchs <laughs> lately. Purport. Srila <clears throat> Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur explains the word nripa cheshtaya, cheshtaya, as follows. In Vrindavan, there was a particular place on the riverbank where people who wanted to cross the Yamuna would, play a, would pay a small tax. At times, the cowherd boys would assemble in this area and prevent the young girls of Vrindavan from crossing the river, insisting that they had to pay customs duty first. Such activities were full of joking and laughter. In this way, Krishna and Balaram played all sorts of well-known games as they wandered among the rivers, hills, valleys, bushes, trees, and lakes of Vrindavan. 17. <clears throat> While Rama, Krishna, and their cowherd boyfriends were thus tending the cows in that Vrindavan forest, the demon, Pralamba, entered their midst. He had assumed the form of a cowherd boy with the intention of kidnapping Krishna in Balaram. Purport. <clears throat> Having described how Krishna and Balaram acted like ordinary boys, Shukadev Goswami will now reveal one of the Lord's transcendental pastimes that is beyond the range of human activity. According to Srila Vishwanath Chakravali Thakur, the demon Pralamba disguised himself as a particular cowherd boy who on that day had remained at home with duties to perform. So see the talent of this demon. He figured out someone who was normally there and took his form. Eighteen. Since the Supreme Lord Krishna, who had appeared in the Dashara dynasty, sees everything, he understood who the demon was. Still, the Lord pretended to accept the demon as a friend, while at the same time seriously considered 
considering how to kill him. This may be sound cruel sometimes to some people, these little boys figuring out who they're going to kill. But try to understand that Kangsa had made this vow, according to his advice of his demoniac ministers, to kill all children in the area, a certain area around Mathura, who had appeared within a certain number of days. Because he knew that Krishna was out there. Narada Muni told him, and he, he, don't, he didn't tell him where. Oh, actually, it was Durga that told him. He had appeared somewhere else in Braj, and he was going to kill him. So he's trying to kill all the children. Now, so this is, this is natural that they, that they are doing this. To protect, just not this, they don't need protection, but protect all the other children in the whole area. <clears throat> Krishna, who knows all sports and games, then called together the cowherd boys and spoke as follows. Hey, cowherd boys, let's play now. We'll divide ourselves into two even teams. Purport. Krishna, who knows all sports and games, then called together the cowherd boys and spoke as follows. Oh, I said that already, sorry. Would you feel more comfortable if you sat here on the floor than on that chair? I know that chair is not very comfortable. If you do, if you feel com uncomfortable, just come and sit here, right here. Okay. Purport. <clears throat> I'll read this again. Krishna, who knows all sports and games, then called together the cowherd boys and spoke as follows. Hey, cowherd boys, let's play now. We'll divide ourselves into two even teams. Purport. The word yata yatam means that Krishna naturally wanted the two teams to be evenly matched so that there would be a good game. In addition to the pleasure of sporting, the purpose of the game was to kill the demon, Perlamba. 20. The cowherd boys chose Krishna and Balaram as the leaders of the two parties. Some of the boys were on Krishna's side and others joined Balaram. The boys played various games involving carriers and passengers. In these games, the winners would climb up on the backs of the losers who would have to carry them. Purport. Srila Sanatan Goswami quotes the following relevant verse from the Vishnu Purana 5.9.12. Harina kridanam namna bala kridanakam tata prakridata ite sarve dvau dvau yukabat utamam upatam utpatam. They then they then paired they then played the childhood game known as Harina Kridanam. Excuse me. They then played the childhood game known as in Harina Kridanam, in which each boy paired off with an opponent and all the boys simultaneously attacked their respective rivals. 22. Thus carrying and being carried by one another and at the same time tending the cows, the boys followed Krishna to a banyan tree known as Bandi, uh, Bandiraka. Purport. Srila Sanatan Goswami quotes the following verses from Sri Haribangsha, Vishnu Parva, 11, 18-22, which describes the banyan tree. The darsha vipalodagra shakinam 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 badam titam daranyam megadbam Nibidam dalasan chenahi ganalar do dikrita karam pravata bogadarinam nila chitranga varnaischa sevitam bahuvik gagaihi pralai pravalais chaganai sendra chapi ganopamam 
Bhavana Karda Vitapam Lata Pushpa Sumanditam Vishala Mula Vanatam Pavanam Bodadarinam Adipatyam Ivanyesham Tasidesha Sisakinam Kurvanam Shubhakarnanam Niravarsham Anhatapam Nyagrodam Pratigagrabham Bandidam Namanamataha They saw that the best of all trees which had many long branches with its dense covering leaves it resembled a cloud sitting on the earth indeed its form was so large that it appeared like a mountain covering half the sky many birds with charming blue wings frequented that great tree whose dense fruits and leaves made it seem like a cloud accompanied by a rainbow or like a house decorated with creepers and flowers it spread its broad roots downward and carried upon itself the sanctified clouds that banyan tree was like the lordly master of all other trees in that vicinity and it performed the all auspicious function of warding off the rain and the heat of the sun <clears throat> such was the appearance of that nyagroda tree known as bandira which seemed just like a peak of a great mountain. Text 23. My dear King Prikshit, when Sri Dhamma, Rishabha, and the other members of Lord Balaram's party were victorious in these games, Krishna and his followers had to carry them. Text 24. Defeated, the Supreme Lord Krishna carried Sri Dhamma, Badrasena carried Vishabha, and Pralamba carried Balarama, the son of Rohini. Purport. <clears throat> One may ask how Bhagavan, the Supreme Lord, can be defeated by his boyfriends. The answer is that in his original form, God has a most playful nature and occasionally enjoys submitting to the strength or desire of his loving friends. A father may sometimes playfully fall down on the ground when struck by his beloved little child. These acts of love give pleasure to all parties. Thus, Sri Dhamma agreed to ride on Lord Krishna's shoulders to please his beloved friend, who happened to be Bhagavan, the Supreme personality of Godhead. Text 25 Considering Lord Krishna invincible, that foremost demon, Pralamba, quickly carried Balaram far beyond the spot where he was supposed to put his passenger down. Purport Pralamba wanted to carry Balaram out of Krishna's sight so that he could cruelly attack him. 26. As the great demon carried Balaram, the Lord became as heavy as a massive Mount Sumeru, and Pralamba had to slow down. <clears throat> he then resumed his actual form, an effulgent body that was covered with golden ornaments and that resembled a cloud flashing with lightning and carrying the moon. Purport. Here the demon Pralamba is compared to a cloud, his golden ornaments to lightning within that cloud, and Lord Balaram to the moon shining through it. Great demons can assume various forms by exerting their mystic power, but when the Lord's spiritual potency curtails their power, they can no longer maintain an artificial form and must again manifest their actual demoniac body. Lord Balaram suddenly became as heavy as a great mountain, and although the demon tried to carry him high on his shoulders, he could not go on. Text 27 When Lord Balaram, who carries the plow weapon, 
saw the gigantic body of the demon as he moved swiftly in the sky. With his blazing eyes, fiery hair, terrible teeth reaching toward his scowling brows, and an amazing effulgence generated by his armlet's crown and earrings, the Lord seemed to become a little frightened. Purport. Srila Sanatana Goswami explains Lord, Balaram, Lord Baladev's so called fear as follows Balaram was playfully acting out the role of an ordinary cowherd boy, and to maintain the mood of this pastime, he appeared slightly disturbed by the horrible demoniac body. Also, because the demon had appeared as a cowherd boyfriend of Krishna's, and because Krishna had accepted him as a friend, Baladev was slightly apprehensive about killing him. Balaram could also have worried that since this cowherd boy was actually a demon in disguise, at that very moment another such demon might have been attacking Krishna, Lord Krishna himself. Thus the omniscient and omnipotent Supreme Lord Balaram exhibited the pastime of becoming slightly nervous in the presence of the horrible demon, Pralamba. 28. Remembering the actual situation, the fearless Balaram understood that the demon was trying to kidnap him and take him away from his companions. The Lord then became furious and struck the demon's head with his hard fist, just as Indra, the king of the demigods, strikes a mountain with this thunderbolt weapon. Purport. Lord Balaram's powerful fist came crashing down upon the demon's head, just as a huge lightning bolt comes crashing into a mountain, cracking its stone surface into pieces. The words Vihaya Sartam Eva may also be divided Vihaya Sa Artam Eva meaning that the demon was flying in the sky on the cosmic path, Vihayas, with the purpose of carrying off Balaram, who was his artam, or object of pursuit. Text 29. Thus smashed by Balaram's fist, Pralamba's head immediately cracked open. The demon vomited blood from his mouth and lost all consciousness, and then... With a great noise, he fell lifeless on the ground like a mountain devastated by Indra. The cowherd boys were most astonished to see how the powerful Balaram had killed the demon Pralamba, and they exclaimed, Excellent! Excellent! 31. They offered Balaram profuse benedictions and then glorified him who deserves all glorification. Their minds overwhelmed with ecstatic love. They embraced him as if he had come back from the dead. 32. The sinful Pralamba. Having been killed, the demigods felt extremely happy and they showered flower garlands upon Lord Balaram and praised the excellence of his deed. Thus in the purports of the humble servants of his divine grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, to the 10th canto, 18th chapter of Srimad Bhagavatam, entitled, Lord Balaram Slays the Demon Pralamba. <laughs> For those who haven't been here before, I think all of you have now, this uh, clapping in between the chapters is like, you know, we're, we're taking this whole work as like a, the master drama, you know, the history of the universe with all these chapters and the chapters, you know, they represent the, the, the uh, what do they call it? The, uh, the acts of the play. So when an act is done, we appreciate pushes off, off into the next chapter with a little more appreciation and ecstasy. Okay. 
19th chapter. Swallowing the forest fire. This chapter describes how Lord Krishna saved the cows and the cowherd boys from a great fire in the Munjaranya forest. <clears throat> One day the cowherd boys became absorbed in sporting and allowed the cows to wander in the way, into a dense forest. Suddenly a forest fire blazed up and to escape its, to escape its flames the cows took refuge in a grove of sharp canes. When the cowherd boys missing their animals, they went to when the, when the cowherd boys missed their animals, they went searching for them, following their hoof prints and the trail of blades of grass and other plants they had trampled or had broken with their teeth. Finally, the boys found the cows and, re and removed them from the cane grove forest. But by that time, the forest fire had grown strong and was threatening both the boys and the cows. Thus the cowherd boys took shelter of Sri Krishna, the master of all mystic power, who had told them to close who told them to close their eyes. They did so, and in a moment he had swallowed up the fierce forest fire and brought all of, and brought them all back to the Bandira tree mentioned in the last chapter. Seeing this wonderful display of mystic potency, the cowherd boys thought Krishna must be a demigod, and they began to praise him. Then they all returned home. Text 1. <clears throat> Shukadev Goswami said, while the cowherd boys were completely absorbed in playing, their cows wandered far away. They hungered for more grass, and with no one to watch them, they entered a dense forest. Text 2 Passing from one part of the great forest to another, the goats, cows, and buffalo eventually entered an area overgrown with sharp canes. The heat of the nearby forest fire made them thirsty, and they cried out in distress. Not seeing the cows before them, Krishna, Rama, and their cowherd friends suddenly felt re repentant for having neglected them. The boys searched all around but could not discover where they had gone. Then the boys, then the boys began tracing out the cow's path by noting their hoof prints and the blades of grass the cows had broken with their hooves and teeth. All the cowherd boys were in great anxiety because they had lost their source of livelihood. 5. Within the Munja forest, the cowherd boys finally found their valuable cows who had lost their way and were crying. Then the boys, thirsty and tired, herded the cows onto the path back home. The Supreme Personality of Godhead called out to the animals in a voice that resounded like a rumbling cloud. Hearing the sound of their own names, the cows were overjoyed and called out to the Lord in reply. Suddenly, a great forest fire appeared on all sides threatening to destroy all the forest creatures. Like a chariot driver, the wind swept the fire onward, and terrible sparks shot in all directions. Indeed, the great fire extended its tongues of flame toward all moving and non-moving creatures. Purport Just as Krishna, Balaram, and the cowherd boys were about to take their cows back home, the forest fire previously mentioned raged out of control and surrounded all of them. Text 8. All the cows and cowherd boys stared at the forest fire attacking them on all sides. They became fearful. The boys then approached Krishna and Balaram for shelter. 
just as those who are disturbed by fear of death approach the Supreme Personality of Godhead. The boys addressed them as follows. The coward boys said, Krishna, O Krishna, most powerful one, O Rama, you whose prowess never fails, please save your devotees who are about to be burned by this forest fire and have come to take, take, to take shelter of you. Krishna, certainly your own friend shouldn't be destroyed, O knower of the nature of all things. We have accepted you as our Lord. We are souls surrendered unto you. Shukadeva Goswami said, Hearing these pitiful words from his friends, the Supreme Lord Krishna told them, Just close your eyes and do not be afraid. Purport. This verse clearly reveals the simple, sublime relationship between Krishna and his pure devotees. The absolute truth, the Supreme Almighty Lord is actually a young, blissful, coward boy named Krishna. God is youthful and his mentality is playful. When he saw that his beloved friends were terrified of the forest fire, he simply told them to close their eyes and not be afraid. Then Lord Krishna acted as described in the next verse, text 12. All right, the boys replied, and immediately closed their eyes. Then the Supreme Lord, the master of all mystic power, opened his mouth and swallowed the terrible fire, saving his friends from danger. Purport. The cowherd boys were suffering from extreme fatigue, hunger, and thirst, and were about to be consumed by a horrible forest fire. All this is indicated here by the word Krichtrat. 13. <clears throat> the cowherd boys opened their eyes and were amazed to find not only that they and the cows had been saved from the terrible fire, but they had all been brought back to the Bandira tree. When the cowherd boys saw that they had been saved from the forest fire by the Lord's mystic power, which is manifested by his internal potency, they began to think that Krishna must be a demigod. Purport. <clears throat> the cowherd boys in Vrindavan simply loved Krishna as their only friend and exclusive object of devotion. To increase their ecstasy, Krishna displayed to them their mystic power, his mystic potency and saved them from the terrible forest fire. The cowherd boys could never give up their ecstatic loving friendship with Krishna. Therefore, rather than consider, considering Krishna to be God after they saw his extraordinary power, they thought that perhaps he, must be, he was a demigod. But since Lord Krishna was a beloved friend, they were on the same level with him, and thus they thought that they too must be demigods. <laughs> In this way, Krishna's cowherd friends became overwhelmed with ecstasy. Text 15. It was now late in the afternoon, and Lord Krishna, accompanied by Balaram, turned the cows back toward home. Playing his flute in a special way, Krishna returned to the cowherd village in the company of his cowherd friends, who chanted his glories. 16. The young gopis took the pledge, greatest pleasure in seeing Govinda come home, since for them, even a moment without his association seemed like a hundred ages. Purport. After saving the cowherd boys from the blazing forest fire, Krishna saved the cowherd girls from the blazing fire of separation from him. The gopis, headed by Srimati Radharani, have the greatest love for Krishna, and even a single moment's separation from him 
seems like millions of years to them. The gopis are the greatest devotees of God and their specific pastimes with Krishna will be described later in this work. Thus end the purports of the humble servants of His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, to the 10th canto, 19th chapter of Srimad Bhagavatam entitled, Swallowing the Forest Fire. Jai Balaram, Jai Sri Krishna, O Premanandi, Hari Hari Bol. Okay, moving quite a lot. This is a wonderful chapter. Chapter 20. <clears throat> the rainy season and autumn in Vrindavan. To enhance the description of Lord Krishna's pastimes, Sri Shukadev Goswami describes in this chapter, the beauty of Vrindavan during autumn and the rainy season. In the course of his presentation, he gives various charming instructions in metaphorical terms. Text 1. Shukade Goswami said, To the ladies of Vrindavan, the cowherd boys then related in full detail Krishna's and Balaram's wonderful activities of delivering them from the forest fire and killing the demon, Pralamba. Text 2. The elder cowherd men and ladies were amazed to hear this account and they concluded that Krishna and Balarama must be exalted demigods who had appeared in Vrindavan. Text 3. Then the rainy season began, giving life and sustenance to all living beings. The sky began to rumble with thunder and lightning flashed on the horizon. The sky then was covered by dense blue clouds accompanied by lightning and thunder. Thus the sky and its natural illumination were covered in the same way that the spirit soul is covered by the three modes of material nature. Purport. Lightning is compared to the mode of goodness, thunder to the mode of passion, and clouds to the mode of ignorance. <clears throat> Thus the cloudy sky at the onset of the rainy season is analogous to the pure spirit soul when he becomes disturbed by the modes of nature. For at that time he is covered and his original brilliant nature is only dimly reflected through the haze of the material qualities. Text 5 With its rays, the sun had for eight months drunk up the earth's wealth in the form of water. Now that the proper time had arrived, the sun began releasing this accumulated wealth. Purport. <clears throat> the Acharyas compared the sons evaporating the earth's wealth of water to a king's collecting taxes. In chapter 20 of Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Srila Prabhupada explains this analogy as follows. Clouds are accumulated water drawn from the land by the sunshine. Continually for eight months, the sun evaporates all kinds of water from the surface of the globe and this water is accumulated in the shape of clouds which are distributed as water when there is need. Similarly, a government extracts various taxes from the citizens such as income tax and sales tax which the citizens are able to pay by their different material activities agriculture, trade, industry and so on. This taxation is compared to the suns drawing water from the earth. When there is again need of water on the surface of the globe, the same sunshine converts the water into clouds and distributes it all over the globe. Similarly, the taxes collected by the government must be distributed to the people again. As educational work, <clears throat> as educational work, 
public work, sanitation work, and so on. This is very essential for a good government. The government should not simply exact taxes for useless squandering. The tax collection should be utilized for the public welfare of the state. Text 6. Flashing with lightning, great clouds were shaken and swept about by fierce winds. Just like merciful persons, the clouds gave their lives for the pleasure of this world. Purport. Just as a great compassion, just as great compassionate personalities sometimes give their lives or wealth for the happiness of society, the rain clouds poured down their rain upon the parched earth. Although the clouds were thus dissipated, they freely provided rainfall for the happiness of the earth. In Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Srila Prabhupada comments as follows on this verse. During the rainy season, there are strong winds blustering all over the country and carrying clouds from one place to another to distribute life-giving water to the needy living entities. Water is urgently needed after the summer season. And thus, clouds are just like a rich man who in times of need distributes his money even to the point of exhausting his whole treasury. So the clouds exhaust themselves by distributing water all over the surface of the globe. When Maharaj Dasharath, the father of Lord Ramachandra, used to fight with his enemies, it was said that he approached them just like a farmer uprooting necessary plants and trees. And, and when there was need of giving charity, he used to distribute money exactly as the cloud distributes rain. <clears throat> the distribution of rain by clouds is so sumptuous that it is compared to the distribution of wealth by a great munificent person. The cloud's downpour is so profuse that the rains even fall on rocks and hills and on the oceans and seas where there is no need for water. The clouds resemble a charitable person who opens his treasury for distribution and who does not discriminate whether the charity is needed or not. He gives in charity open-heartedly, open-handedly. Metaphorically speaking, the lightning and rain clouds is the light by which they see the distressed condition of the earth and the blowing winds are their heavy breathing such as that found in a distressed person. Distressed to see the condition of the earth, the clouds tremble in the wind like a compassionate person. Thus, they pour down their rain. 7. The earth had been emaciated by the summer heat, but she, came fully nur but she became fully nourished again when moistened by the god of rain. Thus the earth was like a person whose body has been emaciated by austerities undergone for a material purpose, but who again becomes fully nourished when he achieves the fruit of those austerities. Purport In Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Srila Prabhupada comments on this verse as follows. Before the rainfall, the whole surface of the globe becomes almost depleted of all kinds of energies and appears very lean. After the rainfall, the whole surface of the earth becomes green with vegetation and appears very healthy and strong. Here, a comparison is made to the person undergoing austerities for fulfillment of a material desire. The flourishing condition of the earth after a rainy season is compared to the fulfillment of material desires. Sometimes, when a country is subjugated by an undesirable government, persons and parties 
undergo severe penances and austerities to get control of the government. And when they attain control, they flourish by giving themselves generous salaries. <clears throat> this also is like the flourishing of the earth in the rainy season. Actually, one should undergo severe austerities and penances only to achieve spiritual happiness. In the Srimad Bhagavatam, it is recommended that tapasya, or austerities, should be accepted only for realizing the Supreme Lord. By accepting austerity in devotional service, one regains his spiritual life. And as soon as one regains his spiritual life, he enjoys unlimited spiritual bliss. But if someone, under, but if someone undertakes austerities and penances for some material gain, then, as stated in the Bhagavad Gita, the results are temporary and are desired only by persons of less intelligence. Text 8. <clears throat> in the evening twilight, during the rainy season, the darkness allowed the glowworms, but not the stars, to shine forth. Just as in the age of Kali, the predominance of sinful activities allows atheistic doctrines to overshadow the true knowledge of the Vedas. I'll read that again. This is so nice. Mm. In the evening twilight, during the rainy season, the darkness allowed the glowworms, but not the stars, to shine forth. Just as in the age of Kali, the predominance of sinful activities allows atheistic do doctrines to overshadow the true knowledge of the Vedas. Purport. Srila Prabhupada comments as follows. During the rainy season, in the evening there are many glowworms visible about the tops of trees, hither and thither, and they glitter just like lights. But the luminaries of the sky, the stars and the moon are not visible. Similarly, in the age of Kali, persons who are atheists or miscreants become very prominently visible, whereas persons who are actually following the Vedic principles for spiritual emancipation are practically obscured. This age, Kali Yuga, is compared to the cloudy season of the living entities. In this age, real knowledge is covered by the influence of the material advancement of civilization. The cheap mental speculators, atheists, and manufacturers of so-called religious principles become prominent like the glowworms. Whereas persons strictly following the Vedic principles or scriptural injunctions become covered by the clouds of this age. People should learn to take advantage of the actual luminaries of the sky, the sun, moon, and stars, instead of the glowworm's light. Actually, the glowworms cannot give any light in the darkness of night, as clouds become clear even in the rainy season, and the moon, stars, and sun become visible. So even in this Kali Yuga, there are sometimes advantages. The Vedic movement of Lord Chaitanya, the distribution of the chanting of the Hare Krishna mantra, is understood in this way. People seriously anxious to find real life should take advantage of this movement instead of looking toward the so-called light of mental speculators and atheists. Text 9. <clears throat> <clears throat> the frogs, who had all along been lying silent, suddenly began croaking when they heard the rumbling of the rain clouds. In the same way that Brahmana students who perform their morning duties in silence begin reciting their lessons when called by their teacher. Purport. Srila Prabhupada comments, After the first rainfall, when there is a thundering sound in the clouds, 
all the frogs began to croak like students suddenly engaged in reading their studies. Students are generally supposed to rise early in the morning. They do not usually arise of their own accord, however, but only when there is a bell sounded in the temple or in the cultural institution. By the order of the spiritual master, they immediately rise, and after finishing their morning duties, they sit down to study the Vedas or chant Vedic mantras. Similarly, everyone is sleeping in the darkness of Kali Yuga, but when there is a great Acharya, by his calling only, everyone takes to the study of the Vedas to acquire actual knowledge. Text 10. <clears throat> With the advent of the rainy season, the insignificant streams, which had become dry, began to swell and then strayed and then strayed from their proper courses, like the body, property, and money of a man controlled by the urges of his senses. Purport. Srila Prabhupada comments, during the rainy season, many small ponds, lakes, and rivulets become filled with water. Otherwise, the rest of the year they, became, they remain dry. Similarly, materialistic persons are dry, but sometimes, when they are in a so-called opulent position, with a home or children or a little bank balance, they appear to be flourishing. But immediately afterwards, they become dry again like the small rivulets and ponds. The poet Vidyapati said that in the society of friends, family, children, wife, and so on, there is certainly some pleasure, but that pleasure is compared to a drop of water in the desert. Everyone is hankering after happiness. Just as in the desert, everyone is hankering after water. If in the desert there is a drop of water, the water is there, of course, but the benefit from that drop of water is very insignificant. In our materialistic way of life, we are hankering after an ocean of happiness. But in the form of society, friends, and mundane love, we are getting no more than a drop of water. Our satisfaction is never achieved as the small rivulets, lakes, and ponds are never filled with water in the dry season. Text 11. The newly grown grass made the earth emerald green. The Indragopa insects added a reddish hue and white mushrooms added further color and circles of shade. Thus the earth appeared like a person who has suddenly become rich. Purport. Srila Sridhar Swami comments that the word Nrinam indicates men of the royal order. Thus the color, colorful display of dark green fields decorated with bright red insects and white mushroom umbrellas can be compared to a royal parade displaying the military strength of a king. Twelve. <clears throat> With their wealth of grains, the fields gave joy to the farmers but created remorse in the hearts of those who were too proud to engage in farming and who failed to understand how everything is under the control of the Supreme. Purport It is common for people living in large cities to become miserable and disgusted when there is ample rainfall. They do not understand or have forgotten that the rain is nourishing the crops they will eat. Although they certainly enjoy eating, they do not appreciate that with the rain, the Supreme Lord is feeding not only human beings, but also plants, animals, and the earth itself. 
modern, sophisticated people often look down their noses at those engaged in agricultural work. In fact, in American slang, a simple, unintelligent person is sometimes called a farmer. There are also government agencies that restrict agricultural production because certain capitalists fear the effect on market prices. Because of various artificial and manipulative practices in modern governments, we find widespread food shortages throughout the world. Even in the United States, among the poverty-stricken. And at the same time, we find the government paying farmers not to plant crops. Sometimes these governments throw huge amounts of food into the ocean. Thus the administration of the arrogant and ignorant those who are too proud to obey the laws of God or too ignorant to recognize them will always cause frustration among the people, whereas a God-conscious government will provide abundance and happiness for all. And we'll stop tonight the reading. Hare Krishna. Okay, we still have our open mic, but we only have one of them. So, it's all yours. The ball is on your court, side of the court. So, anything that came into your mind you want to reflect on, you want to share with us, or something you want to just have more discussion on? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Um, if I remember correctly, listening to one of Gopi Brandon Prabhu's lectures, he was um, explaining that when Krishna comes, mm. he comes with all of the aspects of Krishna, like Vishnu, Narayan, mm. and that the killing of the demons is actually done by Lord Vishnu. Yes. Yeah. Can you expand on that a little? <clears throat> well, all the forms from the demigods are contained within Krishna all the time. Oh. Sorry. All the forms of the uh, of all the expansions and incarnations of Krishna are contained within the form of Krishna. Ahang sarvasya prabhavo, matak sarvam pavartate. He's the source of everything, including the incarnation, his, incarn his own incarnations. He's not different from them, but at the same time, they appear differently and they appear to act differently and have different personalities. But it's the same person. So the reason Krishna has all these expansions and all these different energies is because he is the supreme enjoyer and he doesn't have to work at all because everything he wants to do is done by so many energies that are eager to please him so effortlessly all these things are done but it's not that you never hear anything about a, a Vishnu form coming out and killing the demon and then going back into the form of Krishna that is the inconceivable energy of Krishna. He can do anything. And Jiva Goswami says in the Sandarbhas that unless we actually assimilate that principle and fully accept it, I mean fully, that God is a person and that he can do anything, then nothing you know, surprises us or bewilders us that Krishna could do. 
So he, it says that Krishna doesn't do those things because he's just playing with his boyfriend and he's, he doesn't do those things. It's his, but it, he does it at the same time he's there. Because it's him. Sometimes in the, in the play, in the playful pastimes of the coward boys in Krishna, they'll challenge him. You know, what kind of big man are you? Come on, we're gonna, we'll take care of you. And he says, oh yeah? Who do you think you are? And then he goes like this, with his feet, and turns into the boar, like, and the boys are going, oh, I, I see. And then this way, they, they, they have wonderful exchanges of emotion and playfulness that is just beyond the beyond. But the wonderful thing, I thought, was that even when he does something so wonderful as swallowing a forest fire, which nobody can do, you know, they just think he's a, kind of like a demigod or a special person. And then wasn't it fun? Thinking, well, if he's a demigod, we must be also, so this is great. Here we are, you know. Like a child will think, now I've become a soldier, or now I've become a horse, or now I've become whatever. They do these things. Those are the, that's the source of those kinds of playful, imaginative uh, things. So it's like that. Yeah, we all laughed at that point. Yes, it was quite charming. I mean, I don't, you know, I've never heard or read any other explanation about that. You'll never see any explanation that Krishna changes his form into Vishnu, then kills the demons, because that would ruin everything. That would ruin everything. How could coward boys think that he's just one of us? So maybe it, 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 Vishnu, who does it, but he maintains the form, because he can do that. He already showed. We just showed that he can take all the coward boys into the forest for a whole, out of the forest, back to the homes and do their home things and then come back out for a whole year you know and then show Brahma all those forms turned into you know Vishnu forms and all these things but we never hear him doing that when he's killing one of these demons playfully in front of the cowherd boys and it's interesting too because you know the cowherd boys they weren't aware of that they were, you know, it's described that just as Sita could not actually be touched by Ravana, so when Ravana tried to touch Sita, Sita immediately disappeared and simultaneously created her own form, a Maya Sita, out of material energy, so that he, that's the form he took. And then, of course, at the end, when she was rescued and people were questioning her chastity and her purity, then Lord Ramachandra said, okay, go into the fire. If you come out, then every will all be satisfied. She did, and of course that was it. So like that, um, when the cowherd boys were stolen, Brahma didn't touch the, sto the cowherd boys. The, the same cowherd boys stayed within that area in the uppercut leela and just kept playing. Meanwhile, Krishna expanded into all their forms and the calves, went into the village, and then all those forms and calves interacted with their mothers and fathers and friends. And the calves interacted with the cows and bulls in a way that everyone became, you know, so affectionate toward them, only like they felt for Krishna. Because in Vrindavan, even the mothers have so much affection for their children is natural, but they feel more affection for Krishna. And then when he came back after a year of doing that, because Balaram was held back that day, because it was bir his birthday, so he wasn't there to see the whole thing happen. So Krishna maintained it, because he had to do this for a certain time while Brahma stepped away for a moment. Because when he stepped away for a moment, a whole year went by. So, you know, he had to hide it from Balaram for a whole year. 
and then when when the whole thing came again to do to readjust everything, Balaram was again because it was exactly a year later he was still his birthday, so he was head then then Krishna could you know do everything and then when the cowherd boys when Brahma finally came back, you know all the cowherd boys turned into Vishnu forms and he bewildered Brahma completely. In the meanwhile, the real cowherd boys are playing in the forest and the, and the forms and another form that, that were Maya forms were in the cave being held by Brahma so that Krishna could, so he could think that he had actually stole, stolen the cowherd boys. So finally when Brahma, when the whole thing was over, you know, Brahma left, you know, and, and the, the other, I don't exactly know how that works. This is a mystery. I can't, I, my, my intelligence doesn't go this far. Sorry. But somehow rather those, the boys that were in the caves came back and the boys that were in the, they, they all it merged together into one form and they saw Krishna coming along just as if he were only gone for a minute. Oh, we didn't have time to even eat one bite. Come here. Come on, sit. Let's eat. Let's have lunch together. That's God. That is the Chinche Shakti. And when we can hear these things with full faith and love, not like it's just a story to you know, like entertain us or give us an idea of, you know, poetically or something, or anagorically. Then we can taste it to the extent that we can do that. And it's not black and white. We get gradually, gradually more qualified. And the more qualified we become, the more our senses become controlled, the more our minds become controlled when we come be free from anarthas of lust and anger and greed and avarice and illusion and madness and all these things, avarice, then uh, in these pastimes, in the sounds, we see them. We, we experience them. Then we can really relish. So this is the goal of the Srimad Bhagavatam, to give us a taste for hearing Krishna's pastimes. At first, for the first nine cantos, for understanding the, this, all the details of how he creates his world, how his energies work, how his expansions come to take care of his devotees and take care of the anomalies that need to be adjusted. then we can hear Krishna's pastimes and not think that they're ordinary kids and at the same time, you know, relish how he will do things that, that in front of their eyes means that he cannot be just a demigod, like showing his universal form in, in his mouth, for instance. And, and the love of the Rajbasis are so deep and spontaneous and free from feelings of awe and reverence and any of those things. And Krishna just becomes controlled by them, by their love. And so he acts like all these things. He gets on people's backs and acts like he loses and just has ordinary relationships. But because he is Krishna, he is God, then uh, it's something else. The sweetness becomes so sweet that even when he does supernatural God or things that only God could do, they just say, oh, well, he's so wonderful. <laughs> Amazing. I'm hugging the show. I was just amazed uh, how they. Uh, 
Hare Krishna. Um, she's dead. Thank you. Um, I was just amazed how um, these stories show us how Krishna is serving the coward boys and the coward boys serving him vice versa. Mm. And this is a very nice example of um, cooperation. Mm. So with this cooperation, this pastime can happen. Mm. So it's a um, great example for us how we should act. This is just a felt. Yes, this is the ultimate cooperation. Nice. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maharaj. Um, <coughs> I just want. <laughs> Maharaj, I just wanted to uh, pick up on a point in uh, text 11 uh, where um, in, this chapter or chapter? Uh, in, chap in chapter yeah in chapter 19 uh, the swallowing of the uh, of, of the uh, of the blazing forest fire um, it mentions uh, at the beginning of text 11 uh, that uh, the cowhood boys uh, lost their lost their beloved cows and uh, they were in great anxiety because they had lost their source of livelihood. Mm. Maharaj, I wonder whether you could just explain to us a little about how we're to understand the word livelihood, please. Well, <clears throat> in the Vedic culture, uh, milk was very important. There were no vegans. Uh, and because everything, the milk and, and the water and the, and the land and the vegetation that the cows eat were all completely pure, the milk was nectarian. And uh, cows are naturally domestic animals. There's no such thing as a wild cow. And uh, I mean, there are kind of other creatures that they call wild cows that they Nila Gaya in in Vrindavan in parts of India, the blue cow they call them, but actually it's kind of an antelope or another species. But uh, you know, in in those days the system was that there would there would be so much milk produced because of the numbers of cows they had, and the like like I said the purity of the food they ate and the, the air they breathed and everything. The, the milk was very luxurious and wonderful. And they would trade. They would trade for grains, they would trade for jewels, they would trade for so many things. And they, they, they were completely opulent. You know. And on top of that, the cows were very, very dear. If anybody has lived with cows, especially in India, where they're, they're treated more naturally, they they become so affectionate and so dear and so uh, natural to be with. I was standing uh, next to Srila Prabhupada in Gita Nagari in 1976 when he came to see Gita Nagari. And they have these beautiful brown Swiss cows in the Gita Nagari farm. They're like record purebred record they give more milk than anyone in the in the area they they win prizes in the local fairs and stuff and Prabhupada was watching them with great affection and he stood he just there were others and it wasn't just me there were others and he turned and he looked at us and he said if you just spend a little time with the cows as soon as you're with the cows you come to goodness So even though the cows in Vrindavan are transcendental, there's no, there's Shuddha, Gusat, what's all pure goodness. But when Krishna is in the material world and is in the form of his prakat, lila, or acting like he is a child, or acting like he is a human person, human being, 
then all these opulence of the cows, you know, the livelihood that they get from trading the milk and the, the joy they get from taking the milk and making butter and yogurt and all kinds of milk products and cooking them and, and enjoying seeing Krishna eat them with, and eat them with him. And their company, their, their lovely uh, attitude and th this is all the opulence of the cows and it gives them life, livelihood. Their life is the cows. That's what I think. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Thank you. atmosphere you can taste what it means to have uh, spiritual family life this is what we're supposed to do every day if we do this wherever you are with whoever you're with either by yourself or your friends or with family or whatever you do this every day and life changes absolutely changes and I was hearing again Gopi Pranada was talking about how it doesn't make any difference if you have a big memory or you're scholastic or any of these things the main thing is to hear the Bhagavatam and it was very meaningful because you know he had a school and I lived right next door to the school where he was teaching Sanskrit, but he emphasized always that Sanskrit was just incidental. What we're really doing here is trying to get a taste for hearing the Bhagavatam and understanding the Bhagavatam, even if it's not systematic. Can be, and with some devotees, they want and need to study it systematically. He even went so far as to ask, answer a question of one of his students, how he prepared for a class. And Prabhupada said, well, I mean, uh, uh, Gopi Prabhupada said, well, uh, I used to, in the beginning, I would prepare, you know, systematically the, to give the class. But he said, after a while, I found that it would make it dry. And I was trying to fit in everything that I put in my notes and it stopped me from just speaking. So he said, I learned after a long time, he said, I learned that my real preparation is just to hear every day to keep myself absorbed. And then when I had to give a class and sit down and talk, things come out spontaneously and it's much sweeter and much more satisfying to him and also to those who are hearing. So if we start to you know, measure the scientific or the, the sophistication of the, of the uh, systematic delivery and whether everything's just pronounced quite right and this and that and the, then you lose it. You lose the, the 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 juice, the spontaneous joy of just hearing about Krishna. So that's the purpose of the Bhagavatam. Just to just to become attached to Krishna. Do we have anything from cyberspace? I'll tell you why, because Rati Manjari is in forced at a studio making her magnum opus, you know, al album or whatever it is. She's always very regular at, at questions and everything. 
Hare Krishna. I'm waiting. Or maybe everything's so satisfied I can't. I said this a few days ago when Vaishya Shikha Prabhu and I, who have been doing this for like a long time, 17 years, in Kartik, as our Vrat, for during Kartik, we go there and we read five hours a day, like this, with 25, 30 devotees. And then we have, periodically, we have reflections and questions and discussions, and then we keep going on. So after doing it for a few years, we kind of got an idea of how much we could read. And every year we, f we decide what we're going to read. And I think it was two years ago, we decided that if we could read the whole third canto of the Bhagavatam in 28 days, that would be an accomplishment. So we started halfway through the month, we finished the third canto. We looked at each other. Everybody was looking at each other. What's going on here? Why? Well, let me. Let's just go as far as we can go. I don't remember exactly where we were in terms of days. I don't remember, but we just kept reading, and we finished the whole fourth canto also. In that number of days, of course, right at the end, in order to actually make it, we had a couple of seven-hour days with, you know, two hundred pages, you know. But we made it, and at that moment. We all were sitting there, and we were stunned. Just like you don't feel like getting up, you don't feel, you don't like going anywhere, doing anything else. It's so satisfying, and we were all just stunned. What happened just now? And then he picked up the books all together, and he put them together, and they were like this big. And he said, "We just read." And then he picked up one book and he put the page, you know, up like this. We just read this whole thing, every page. In that time, none of us could believe it. We couldn't believe it, and that's, you know, we've been doing it for a long time. It was out of this world. So, miracles happen if you just hear every day. Just make time, change your priorities, and just do this at least an hour a day. And if you're by yourself, just open up the book, and go through it page by page and read to yourself out loud carefully never mind how many how fast or whatever and your life will change guaranteed one time I remember I was with Srila Prabhupada and he said if you're ever in anxiety just pick up any one of my books and open it up to any page and start to read and your anxiety will if you do that sincerely your anxiety will immediately go away. So that's what he meant by, you know, re-spiritualizing human society by the mass distribution of, especially the Srimad Bhagavatam, Bhagavad Gita, Srimad Bhagavatam, and Chaitanya Charitam, especially these books. Getting close to two hours, I'm going to stop. Hare Krishna. Srila Prabhupada ki jai. Srimad Bhagavatam ki jai. Sri Krishna Leela ki jai. And we're here tomorrow night. There are the rest of the chapter about autumn and how it mean what it means in terms of all kinds of things. See you tomorrow night, same time, same places, right here in Olive Tree College. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.